It is the ideology of the most powerful political faction in the U.S. government. It caused the biggest news events of the 21st century. On July 10th, at Unregistered Academy, we will begin a two-part live interactive course on neoconservatism. We will examine the history and the ideas of the neoconservatives who remade the world. Go to unregisteredacademy.com to learn more and to sign up now. Thanks. This is the Unregistered Podcast, and I'm Thaddeus Russell. This is a show about ideas, people, and behaviors that are considered inappropriate, out of bounds, or beyond the pale. The things you're not supposed to talk about if you're a school teacher, a college professor, a businessman, a politician, a parent, a neighbor, or even a podcast host. These are the things you're not supposed to say or even think if you're a good liberal, a good conservative, or a good citizen. Each week, I'll interview a person who has something bad to say. They might be a journalist or a professor. They might be a porn star or a drug dealer. They might just be an ordinary person with an ordinary job who doesn't care about the rules of polite society. I'm not interested in breaking the rules just to be a troublemaker. I'm interested in people who break the rules of conventional thought and to expand the scope of what is possible to say in our society. I'm interested in people who make me think. At Icarus Fest, I sat down with my two favorite analysts of our contemporary culture to find out why it is that in the last 20 to 30 years, things have tasted and smelled and felt and sounded different. In other words, I wanted to know what this neoliberalism thing is. This is my interview with Jack Mason and Jeff Schillinger. Welcome to the first panel of the Icarus Festival of 2023. We just watched Safe, the film starring Julianne Moore. Scared a lot of us. Uh, scared a lot of us when we first saw it. And I think it uh, says a lot, maybe, about the world we live in. The reason we have that film in this festival is really, it's funny, it's because of one person. Uh, it's this guy right here, Jack Mason, who I don't even know when I heard you talk about it, but you've talked about it several times. and. It was so compelling what he said about it that I had to go watch it, and he was right, as he is often about things. So I want to begin first by introducing Jack Mason, the perfume nationalist, host of the very popular uh, with a podcast with a fan base that um, is extremely passionate, we found out, when he announced it. Uh, when he announced that he was going to be here, there was a flood of ticket sales from his people. So it really spoke a lot to the, the, uh, the intensity of the Perfume Nationalist audience, which was not surprising at all. And here we have Jeff Schulenberger, who is the general uh, managing editor sorry, of Compact Magazine, which is a co-sponsor of the festival. And as I said at the beginning of SAFE, uh, it's clearly the best political cultural analysis magazine out there. I don't really see any competitors. It's only been going for a year and a quarter, but it, it's remarkable in many ways, but just off the top, you can look at the, the list of authors, writers for Compact, and you have socialists and communists and libertarians and conservatives and paleos and all sorts of people across the political spectrum, all of whom are united by one thing, which is a skepticism or opposition to sort of the liberal dominant establishment. And that's it. But otherwise, they have all sorts of differences. And it's also, I find Compact, because of Jeff, is, is always operating at an extremely high level while being very accessible. So I find it to be extremely intellectually sophisticated, but easy to read. Um, so to me, that's the perfect magazine. And it's been an incredible accomplishment watching Jeff do this. I knew him before he took the job, and watching him grow it this fast, the way it, he has done, has been quite stunning. So I'm sitting next to my two favorite people here, obviously, and also, I mean, two people who are really influential for me, 
who have changed the way I think about the world. I, I said before safe, like I don't, I don't, I don't spend too many, there aren't too many days I let pass without thinking about Jack's analysis of neoliberal culture. Uh, just when I literally walk down the street of any city, I think about him and, and think about his critique of aesthet aesthetics in the age we live in. So I wanted to begin this conversation by asking Jack sort of what is it about SAFE that you find so compelling and important? What is it, yeah, and I guess also I want you to answer at some point, you know, is it in her head or is it somewhere else? I think I know what your answer is, but just go ahead and talk about it. Um, so when I first saw SAFE, I rented it on VHS when I was in eighth grade. I knew nothing about it. It seemed like this just uh, self-contained, mysterious 2001 A Space Odyssey object. I didn't know what it meant. I'd never seen anything narratively like it. Um, I couldn't tell what it meant. Like, everything that you expect to happen to Carol, um, it's subverting the uh, disease, TV uh, movie of the week, like disease movie, um, just like Todd Haynes' previous movie, Superstar, the Karen Carpenter story was, with uh, the proliferation of anorexia TV movies of the 80s. Um, and you, first of all, are given a totally bl total blank slate of a character. She's rich. She... Um, has this mansion, she lives in the San Fernando Valley. Uh, the way that it's depicted, uh, if you don't know anything about it, all of her problems seem real on first viewing, uh, but as soon as she seeks enlightenment, everything starts getting worse and worse for her. And like all great art, it's open-ended and open to so many interpretations. And something interesting about it is that people who have environmental illness and fibromyalgia and all these kind of like uh, woman's diseases that I like mock all the time that we that are so popular now um, those people love this movie as an accurate uh, depiction of what they're going through um, and watching it now is so different than watching it in the 2000s because everything that seems so uh, sharp and satirical and kind of ridiculous about it, then it seems very loose and just like realistic now. Like, I mean, when I first watched this, like seeing someone with a mask was such an alien thing. You only saw like Michael Jackson and Japanese people with masks. Um, the the 80s uh, pastiche, the 80s period piece uh, element of it, um, it's different now also since we've seen like 15 years of 80s nostalgia. Um, I think that Todd Haynes really was keyed into something really psychically true and he could see the future because uh, this also invented the whole kind of vaporwave 80s mall nostalgia genre where you take stuff that, you know, in the mid-90s and 2000s was considered so corny and embarrassing 80s aesthetics and make it into this weird space age aesthetic mm. that's like haunting and you know you, you want to be there um it was just something totally new and he was doing a period piece about 1987 in 1994. <laughs> um i on this viewing the second half seemed a lot sadder like when i you know that's like getting older as you kind of are more empathetic with characters like this. When I was young and just like, I'm a cinephile, just kind of like laughing at her. Oh, here's this empty woman making up, making up problems. Um, but I felt a little optimism for her at the end that I never really felt before because the James Legro character makes her laugh. She just needs to date him, you know? <laughs> and I kind of never thought that much about that character, but he really is the first person who makes her laugh in the movie and the first person who she can be kind of loose around and not like strict and formal. Um, so she is getting worse with her, is it real or is it not, uh, kind of psychosomatic illness. But she laughed for the first time and she has this little group of people who is celebrating her exactly as she is when she gives her awkward little speech, which I think is 
one of the best pieces of acting like in all cinema mm. about going into buildings and <laughs> it's it's exactly the kind of thing that sort of comes out of your mind after reading a bunch of brochures and being filled with this kind of like this kind of like maybe crackpot ideology but um, yeah I felt a lot more sympathy and I wasn't you know sneering at the the empty housewife uh, like and people were mystified also when it came out no one knew what to think of it because um, Todd Haynes was very highly touted as like the preeminent queer art director and he did this which has nothing gay in it except a kind of vague connection to AIDS um, in the sort of time period and the the illness aspect of it uh, but it's a much more popular and well-known movie now um, because people can see what it predicted and Lester, the haunting figure that's covered head to toe in sweaters and everything, who's just walking through a field and can barely exist with anyone around him. I mean, it doesn't seem uh, exaggerated at all now because you see it every day. We still are surrounded by the COVID detri detritus of plexiglass and uh, people in masks. And, you know, this time I was thinking when she got to Renwood, Claire hugs her. Even hugging now is kind of stigmatized. Um, and Peter Dunning, the chemically, the person whose perspective is incredibly vast because he's a chemically sensitive person with AIDS, amazing line. Um, <laughs> you expect him, uh, when he's introduced, to be a good character because AIDS is supposed to endow you with this like saint-like status, uh, especially in like 1995 in a well-known gay filmmaker's uh, movie. Um, and most of all the advice that he gives them is eventually about turning within and uh, not allowing yourself to like hate yourself that you cause everything and like I used to think it was all wrong and all bad but honestly when he says I stopped reading the news <laughs> I think it's true <laughs> because the news is designed to derange people and on a you know on a personal level it deranges you to be involved in this unending, deliberately stressful plot line where you feel you have to play an important role and you have to like do something uh, to be responsible every day. Um, so watching it this time, I was like, wow, he's, he's kind of right about that. Um, yeah, I mean, what, what did you think this time? It's, it's a special kind of yeah. uh, torture that I would design to make people watch safe at 10 a.m. Uh, <laughs> when there's like a toxic smog cloud rolling. Uh, apparently, I mean, it's like beautiful weather here, so I don't know where the smog is, but. Um, so Icarus Festival is dedicated to those of us who fly clo too close to the sun. And uh, early on in your, in your monologue there, uh, you, you described these diseases as women's diseases. Um, so I just want you to know that there have been people, this is true, people in town uh, who have protested Icarus Fest because this makes them feel unsafe. That's actually the word that was used by an adult human being. In Rutherford, um, I think someone who has political power, in fact, but um, Jag, you're, and it's probably mostly about you. Uh, but let's talk about this. So gender obviously is very important here, and we haven't quite talked about that yet. But I mean, so the feminist take on this is that she's experiencing these problems not because she's sick, but because she is a housewife, right? In some in a bourgeois nuclear family that is not fulfilling for women, she feels alienated and isolated because of it unfulfilled, classic Betty Friedan, second wave feminism critique. What do you make of that? Um, so the sort of open-ended interpretation of this is a testament to how good Todd Haynes is at doing a certain type of female character because feminists like superstar the Karen Carpenter story too, which is just mocking anorexia. I mean, the anorexia Holocaust has disappeared <laughs> because the whole country is morbidly obese, so it's kind of hard to sell, sell the idea of six million women, six million women a day seeing Kate Moss in an ad and uh, immediately dying because they've seen uh, heroin chic beauty images. But like with Naomi Wolf, like the beauty myth, all these books would make those claims. Like, I mean, with numbers like that, just like 
girls dropping dead every day from anorexia. Um, but Todd Haynes does that, does these sharp satires while kind of getting it through with the, this is a sympathetic portrait of a complicated woman um, thing. So it doesn't seem, like Mike White does something similar. And it's a way to get kind of subversive stuff through Hollywood and uh, not get kind of uh, attacked in the way you would if you were just making some openly misogynist movie that was like mocking women and their fake illnesses. Um, but why safe resonates so much with like the perfume aspect of what I do is because I attribute uh, the uh, kind of loss of cultural freedom in America and all over the globe to when smoking bans started, which sounds you know, funny when you think about it. Oh, because cigarettes are bad and everything, but it really was uh, an experiment in limiting people's freedom based on a uh, kind of dubious health threat. Um, and it was weak people standing up because they have a disease and they cannot tolerate this bad thing. And the, the effects of this were it destroyed public life. Bars aren't the same, concerts aren't the same. Um, there's just not the kind of freedom of communing with other people that you have now that there's this ambient uh, kind of politeness um, and fear of offending anyone with a smell. And the 80s, as rep represented in SAFE, were a time period of perfumes that were louder than ever before. Giorgio, poison, opium. Uh, it was a time where everybody... Uh, wore tons of fragrance and could be smelled from 20 feet away. Um, and this was just fine. You went into the office like that. It was the spirit of the 80s. And then there was a big reaction against that in the 90s. And scent-free spaces started popping up um, after smoke-free spaces started popping up. It all came from California. Um, and now we have these, like, signs and public places that say this is a scent-free zone or whatever and you know I believe that someone can get sick from a scent but most of it is psychosomatic terror from knowing that there's a strong presence nearby that you can't control it's all about control um, and if you have this kind of safe Renwood COVID mindset everything must be controlled top down from the highest levels of society. Um, it's just considered rude and inconsiderate to smoke, wear a strong fragrance, whatever. And the way that SAFE captures that turning point in culture, um, which the kind of antiseptic, smoke-free, scent-free feeling that we have now in America didn't really, didn't really uh, set in until several decades later. Like the so-called like barely there sense of the 90s that were a reaction against the 80s ones. They all seem extremely loud now. CK1, um, Aqua de Gio, Cool Water. Uh, but it's, yeah, it's like this assertion of personal freedom. Um, it's all connected. There's aspects of it of fibromyalgia, of sense sensitivity, of all of this that are real, but I do think it's really triggered by um, knowing that someone is breaking a rule somewhere. Mm -hmm. um, so the result of this counter-revolution, I guess, that went on following the 1980s and all of its loud fragrances was, as you said, sort of an antiseptic culture. Does anyone feel that in this world? I mean, those of us who are older than 30, who are around in the 80s and 90s, does it seem like something has changed? When you walk into a store, do they, does it look different? Do houses look different? Are they designed different? Are the colors different? Not just the smells. The smells, I think he's made a very good case that we don't smell things anymore, certainly not like we used to. So the human experience, the human experience, right, the sensual experience has been radically reduced, limited in the world we live, the, literally the air we breathe, right, has changed in the last 30 years, according to Jack Mason. And when he says this, I can't help but just when I'm walking around, think about this and notice that he's right. 
it seems almost obvious. The dominant color nowadays in design is what? Is a non-color, it's gray. Or if you're really crazy, it's black and white, right? If you go, all the, all the bourgeois towns in America, all the houses in them are all now, I don't know if you notice this, if you go to like the fancy neighborhoods, the, all the houses are painted black and white now. That's the dominant style, right, for new houses. So we are living in what has been called a neoliberal world, and if neoliberalism means anything, and maybe it doesn't, to me, that's what it means. Because the people who are the heads of the, the, the regime that we live in, meaning the politicians who are powerful, the people who control the government and all the institutions, academic institutions, cultural institutions, art institutions, right? They are of this mindset that we must create a world that is purely, and I want you to talk about this, egalitarian, right? And so the only way to achieve perfect equality is to reduce all the differences, right? And so when you reduce differences, you reduce things that are interesting. You reduce things that are human, because humans, in my view at least, each are different. Each is different than the next. So this is, again, I'm just sort of explaining why I love this guy, why I love this, this critique, and why I think it's so important, because it's about, I do politics. Jeff and I do politics. Most people here do politics. We never talk about the way things smell. We never talk about the way things feel or taste. Right? We don't. We're interested in economics and the government and social movements and war all of which are extremely important, but what is more important than what things feel like right now in the, in the world you're living in? So that's the importance, I think, here. But let's, I want to get to equality in a little bit. I'd love to hear your take on that. But Jeff Schollenberger, so I don't know your take on this film, and I'm curious what it is. Well, it's interesting that um, you know, the past few days, suddenly you know, we were inundated with these air quality index. Yeah. Um, charts and graphs and um, you know these maps of like this this toxic flow of you know this uh, this bad air kind of so many warnings to not go outside many warnings um, to wear a mask but you know it's right in and we had a kind of uh, hopefully brief but notable in um, in this area revival of the, you know all the kind of COVID protocols um, and so, you know, it, it was it was a very uh, interesting few days to be thinking about this film before seeing it again. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think that you know, the, the, suddenly this focus on the air, right? And 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 interestingly, the way that it's like mediated through the, this these kind of statistics and models and and charts and graphs. So like, yeah. there's some way that it's not. I mean, and, and this is something I wanted to bring up. I mean, something with with COVID, but also you know that speaks to. Um, to Carol's experience in the film is like, you know, it's this invisible um, nemesis, right, that's, that's sort of around you at all times and that you can't really, but that you can't apprehend directly. And so, you know, I think, and then so, so you kind of try to find different ways of like reading it or, or being able to, um, you know, finding some kind of medium through which you can apprehend it. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it, and th this was the interesting thing about, it. I mean, I just um, wrote something about this book that came out in France, um, was just published in English, called The Conspiracist Manifesto. It's by this sort of far left collective. But it's kind of the, wow. it's, a, it's a far too late sort of, you know, far left anti-lockdown manifesto that, you know, only came out when it didn't really matter anymore, which is itself just like the left. part of what I was writing about. But, um, you know, it does, uh, it, it, it very early on, it says something like, you know, this is the first, um, the first uh, plague that you know people had to be persuaded of its of its danger, right? In other words, mm. that the media needed to be used to mm. um, to make people aware of it because, mm. in some on some level, it was imperceptible, invisible, etc. Mm. And so, you know, I think um, an interesting point here that that relates to the film. And I mean, it was interesting that you know you brought up the point about uh, the you know uh, what's his name the. Um, the, the uh, Dunning, right? The the doctor or the who, the who Peter you know, Dunning. Peter Dunning, right? Who leads the um, the, the retreat uh, says that he stopped reading that he stopped reading the news or you know watching the news and um, you know there is some interesting stuff about media in the film. I mean, in fact, there's a point at which she says she's talking to her friend and she says, uh, "I know how I got sick because it was it was something about like how an orange." 
um, you know, her husband put an orange in his in a bag, and it had a newspaper in it. And the newsprint is one of the things that, according, I guess, to the allergist that she visited. Our new couch. What's that? Totally toxic. Right, right, right. Yeah. <laughs> so you know, so she's she's trying to find this way of make rendering the world legible, right? Uh -huh. But interestingly, one of the things that she's allergic to, it turns out, is newsprint is like the ink in newsprint. So. You know, it's it's kind of the the media themselves are have this kind of toxicity, um, and then yeah, I mean this this problem of legibility, right? How do you how do you sort of read the world where there are all these kind of invisible dangers hiding in it? Um, and so, you know, that that's in a way the story of the film. And you know, I think in terms of COVID, it's again, it's it it largely is something you read through this kind of mediation through. Um, simulations, models, charts, graphs, and so on. So in other words, you, you kind of have to turn away from the world in order to read it, and of course that makes you, you know, that, that, that in a sense is part of what renders you vulnerable to kind of control from this sort of technocratic mm -hmm. apparatus, right, which can decide, okay, well, here's the model that we're gonna claim is, is the, the one we have to believe. So, you know, the, the film, I mean, obviously is kind of partly about her and you know, in relation to the feminism stuff, I mean, there's this scene where she, um, she she's trying. You know, they're doing one of these exercises where she's lying down, and she says she starts describing like the room she had as a child. And she says there was yellow wallpaper, right? So this is clearly a reference to Charlotte Perkins Gilman's uh -huh. um, the yellow wallpaper, sort of pioneering feminist short story, right? That's kind of about this woman who's confined, who's um, you know, because she's experiencing, you know, what Freud would have called hysteria, as, as I would say, you know, going back to it's all in your head, uh -huh. you know, a, as I would say um, Carol is, but, you know, the hysteria both is and isn't all in your head because the point is that it, the whole point of it is that it manifests in real physical symptoms, it's just that they don't have a, an organic cause that can be identified, right, and that's repeatedly said by the doctor. So that's one place where the legibility becomes a problem, the medical institution can't provide a sort of, you know, and again, this is, um, you know, it, it can't provide a, a sort of means of reading what's happening, right? So she has to turn to other kind of authorities. But, um, but clearly there's kind of this feminist dimension where, you know, she's, she's in a way, you know, you said Betty Friedan, mm -hmm. um, you know, I was reminded recently, Betty Friedan said that she compared the, and this was, you know, writing pretty soon after, like the, the, Nazi concentration camp, she compared the suburban home to a concentration camp. What do you have in concentration camps? Well, of course, poison sure. gas. Um, yeah. And so, you know, there, there's something there, but there's also something going all the way back to Freud, to, you know, this basic paradigmatic experience of like the affluent woman in modernity who is suddenly afflicted by all of these symptoms that the, the traditional medical authorities can't deal with, right? And yeah. so then what happens at that point? Well. You know, you you find new authorities or new authorities assert themselves who will supply that kind of means of of, of reading the situation. So uh -huh. you know, here we have that in the form of of Dr. Dunning, who I think is yeah, sort of an ambiguous figure. I don't know. I mean, it seems like he's he's interesting. Um, you know, the scene where they look up, it is ha he has like this vast like white mansion up on the hill. <laughs> right, right. And, you know, there's something odd about, you know, he's holding hands with the, the woman who welcomes her when she arrives. Um, so it's not quite clear what their relationship is. But, you know, it, it's, you, you don't quite know whether to read him as a sinister and ultimately, uh, you know, exploitative figure or not. But, um, you know, he's, so he's one version of this kind of new authority, this new kind of, authority that can assert itself, right? And we have plenty of examples of this. You know, you name the like weird condition, whether it's Morgellons, uh, you know, which sort of emerges around this time, um, or chronic Lyme. Mm -hmm. And there are, you know, there are people with medical degrees who will sort of verify that that is real. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, what, what, what we end up with COVID is, I would, you know, one way of reading it is we have this kind of you know, in a way, the takeover of the entire sort of biomedical apparatus by this mm -hmm. this kind of charlatanism. Mm -hmm. um, not not that it wasn't already <laughs> evident, but um, you know. And then we have like the the whole long COVID phenomenon, which you know would be be another example of this. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. I mean, the, these are these are just a bunch of stray thoughts. But I, I think it is kind of this. You know, it's ultimately about a th 
it's a film that's kind of about authority and who, who will provide a kind of model or means of, of reading and making sense of this world that doesn't, that it ceased to make sense. Yeah. And, you know, it's, it's interesting that you have, you know, these the sequence of doctors who kind of, you know, treat her in different ways. And then, you know, beyond that, you have her as this kind of oddly infantilized figure, right? I mean, she's the milkaholic. Um, you know, she's, she's um, you know, at the very beginning, it's like, I mean, so we find out her, the child, you know, the child who calls her mom is not actually her child, so she's in some way seemingly infertile. It seems like in part that's because she is herself a kind of child figure mm -hmm. um, within, this, yeah. within this household. Um, <clears throat> And, you know, she's, and, you know, she doesn't, um, I mean, you know, there's all this stuff that's like, again, the kind of classic feminist reading where you have like, the doctor hands the psychiatrist's card to the, to the husband and not to her. Yeah, right. right. You know, which is kind of that classic 50s situation where like, mm -hmm. basically the woman's psychiatrist would like, get on the phone with the husband and tell him what they talked about afterwards and mm -hmm. stuff. So, you know, it, it is this movie that's kind of about, um, her kind of drifting between these different authorities who, you know, claim to be able to provide some kind of, not only some kind of, um, you know, legibility to, to confer some kind of legibility on the world, but also to, you know, cr provide a kind of order uh, uh, that will, you know, make sense and that will, um, you know, provide her with some sort of stability because, you know, at the very beginning we see her as this kind of, you know, creature of this house, right? But then the house itself, it's, you know, it's initially like the, the black sofa is like the stain that emerges in this seemingly perfect space. Um, and then, you know, from there, the house itself, which, it, you know, she seems to just be entirely a creature of, becomes this hostile environment that she has to flee from ultimately. But then her, her attempts at escape kind of, you know, she, she starts breathing the toxic fumes from the, car in front of her, mm -hmm. and, and so on and so forth. I mean, that, you know, there's that sequence where she descends into hell, basically in the parking lot. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, one final thing before I stop. Um, I find it, I'm curious what you think about this, but these scenes where she's like having these panic attacks, or the, where she's having the coughing fit, the scenes where she's supposedly not able to breathe, like those seem like the most kind of like hammy and kind of ridiculous, like her, it's as if the character is sort of acting badly in some way, um, you know, which, you know, and Julian Moore, you know, as you said, is, is just incredibly brilliant throughout this, but there's something like, I, I think like slightly off, but seemingly like deliberately off in the way those scenes are performed. Mm -hmm. Like, mm -hmm. Well, it's that kind of performative coughing is like everywhere now. I mean, oh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> if, sure, you, sure, if sure. you smoke outside, you know, oh, 20, yeah, yeah, yeah. 20 feet away, one of those people Absolutely. will do that, so it's just not. Oh my yeah. God. In 1995, maybe that was like an uncommon, like exaggerated thing. But when Nell, the woman who's screaming for the taxi not to go into Renwood, you're right. contaminating this entire area. I mean, that's like a view of yeah. your future as you're following the path of Morgellons yeah. or chronic Lyme or whatever. You become that lady. Yeah, and you know, and just that, like much of New York City was that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and you know, the, 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 and it's not just like an individual policing you in that way. It's like top-down state control yeah. <laughs> policing you that so way. Interestingly, I mean, in, in New York, one thing I found was that, like, for example, the subways, like, the, the MTA employees and the police, like, never enforced the mask thing. Mm -hmm. So it was more the Nels of the world who, like, mm -hmm. you know, you'd walk on the subway car and mm -hmm. without a mask and... You know, they were the ones who were essentially providing the enforcement. <laughs> That's so much more effective <laughs> it's, it's, than yeah. just like st the state forbidding something. Yeah. Uh, people doing it for free yes, for you is exactly. so much more effective, and that's the eventual aim exactly. of all those sorts of things. But the, but the interesting thing with her, yeah, the performative coughing is like she's in the car alone, so it's kind of this performance for herself in right. some sense. Right. Yeah, um, yeah. And she seems to be like almost trying to keep Convincing it herself. And weirdly it's like... It's not clear, it's like, it seems like she thinks or she's trying to imagine that she's like in a swerve and like
like smash into something, but actually she seems to be driving pretty skillfully. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's a kind of release for her. It's like a kind of little, uh, difficult little orgasmic release when she has these episodes where she's coughing yeah. alone or like when she gets to Renwood and she's clearly so moved by the, the speech and give yourself to love and all of this, she doesn't know how to let it out besides go to her cabin and kind of cry and sing the, the Stevie Nicks, Don Henley song, um, uh, you know, and these chopped little phrases. So she just is so repressed, she has no outlet. And the only time you see her uh, angry a little is, or asserting herself a little, is in the middle. After she has the attack at the dry cleaners and she has a tone that she has nowhere else in the movie, uh, where she's telling Greg that she wants to go to Renwood, she asserts that it's the chemicals, and then that kind of confidence leaves the second she's in a new group. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, something else really interesting to me about watching this now is that it acts as kind of a metaphor of red pilling and horseshoe theory because once people realize the media is fake for the first time and like liberals are controlling you and it's all rigged and you know rigged against men and what have you and, you know you realize it's all all fake there's a period where you have that like confidence like oh i figured everything out now um and you find a new group of people to be around uh but what does that new group of people do well they descend into the exact kind of health trends and obsessive medical stuff that you see in this movie. So you have all these right-wing niche health trends of seed oils and, you know, not touching receipts and everything. And regardless of whether that stuff is real, I have no doubt that seed oils are bad, food quality is bad. Um, that all becomes exactly the kind of anti-vax California rich housewife thing. Those ladies were doing it way before bodybuilders online were doing it. You know, um, I, I want to make it clear that I was uh, raised by a feminist mother uh, who was, uh, was a radical feminist, and all of her friends were radical feminists. I grew up in the '60s and '70s. Uh, through the '70s, most of her most of her friends were not just radical feminists; they were also lesbians who chose to be separatists for political reasons. I grew up in Berkeley in the '60s and '70s around nothing but feminists, and every man was trained to be a feminist from birth. I mean. The idea of calling a, a woman over the age of 18 a girl is anathema. I mean, you would get smashed for saying that. And, and then I spent the rest of my life in New York City and Los Angeles and California. So I, you know, I've been around this world. So I'd like to be able to say something about it, even though I am officially a man. Um, I want to tell you about a person, one of the people I knew in that world, who was a, is a very major feminist thinker. Her name was Naomi Weistein. New York City, 1960s, was involved in many of the radical feminist movements of the time, helped found several major feminist organizations, um, successfully fought for uh, better enforcement of rape laws, uh, fought successfully for ending discrimination in workplaces, stuff that you know I'm all for. I think most of us would be all for, at least in some level. Um, I certainly wouldn't find it objectionable. Naomi Weistein, though, she died 10 years ago. She spent the last 30 years of her life in her apartment in Manhattan. She didn't leave. And then she died, all because of an affliction, which she called, in the pages of the New York Times Magazine, chronic fatigue syndrome. She was one of the first people in this country to be diagnosed with CFS, and she said that she actually died from it. She said she was dying from it, and then she died from it. Um, and I just wonder, what is the connection? Is this just a coincidence? Um, Jordan Peterson, I'm annoyed that I'm even saying those words, but like he has said that one of the things we are experiencing in this world that we have seen changing in the last 30 or so years is a feminization, what he calls a feminization of American culture. And I'm just wondering if that's what we're seeing here. Was this movie representative of the beginning of that? And I wanna know, what is it about feminism that ended up being a vehicle for coughing in public when they smell something? Um, what is that? I, we, this is, to me, this is the really controversial, dangerous stuff. And yes, I know it's three dudes. We have to play the identity politics game here. 
I'm sorry, I'm gonna still insist that I'm allowed to speak about such things and I'm gonna insist that you guys are too. But I'm curious, Jack, I mean, I know you have lots of ideas and opinions about gender and how it relates to this, but go ahead with that. Um, and how it relates to the spread of fibromyalgia and performative coughing and whatnot, uh, these are things that straight up only afflict like wealthy, bored people. And I'm not being like one of those like wealth is bad like people. It's just a fact. You don't get more gallons unless you're like Joni Mitchell or Carly Simon living on whatever that island is that you know. Like it's a certain type of person who gets it, but it's the kind of the view of there being this ambient threat that's like invisible shape shifting and can oppress you at any moment and giving it this medical backing is something that's very appealing to a lot of women. First of all, women go to doctors a lot more than men. <laughs> men are scared of the doctor. Women are not. Um, so the second you have this kind of like medical backing of an ideology, which we saw the final you know, the Ultima weapon version of that with COVID, we, you know, when they revealed that COVID, the virus was actually white supremacy and actually Trump and actually all, you know, all these objectionable things. That's the real virus. Um, I don't feel like I see so much feminism in safe. Like, it's the kind that's really refreshing to me now, like that, is it, the Betty Friedan, where it was just about like rich ladies, like Stepford wives, whereas like my husband kind of ignores me and I want to be a photographer and uh, you know, <laughs> I don't want to wear a frilly dress. I love that kind of thing because it came before the relentless intersectionality, which was all about, you know, race and income disparity and everything. Um, I don't know, maybe it's because I'm softer these days, but I don't, I don't really see the, feminism that much and safe. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I mean, I'm wondering if it's a feminist movie or a critique of feminism. It's maybe both simultaneously. It's, it's both simultaneously. I think that Superstar is a lot more, um, uh, more direct about that because the anorexia uh, cause was taken up so eagerly by feminists of that time. Right. right which has I mean, disappeared. Yeah, it, Is there anything sexist you'd like to say? <laughs> sure. I mean, you know, it's, it's interesting to me, again, that it's, you know, it's clearly, you know, it kind of goes back to this Betty Friedan feminism. It harks back, as I said, to the Yellow Wallpaper, which was written, what, like 1910 or something like that? I mean, kind of around the time of Freud, basically. Um, so it, you know, in a way, these themes are kind of the old ones of, of just like, what do you do with like an affluent woman who doesn't really have that much to do with herself? And, and she's also just, you know, again, she's kind of infantilized. It's very odd, like she's kind of this blank slate, like we don't really know where she, she tells us at one point she came from Texas originally, but has lived in California most of her life. We see like a picture of her on the, on the, um, a sort of side table as a child. But like, we don't, you know, she's in a way this like very empty figure. She just doesn't, um, she seems to be, just kind of, and you know, the moment where she asks, like, where am I? You know, it, it, it's like, yeah, in some way she's just, she, she seems to just have no direction, no particular purpose, um, other than like things that are, I don't know. And, and again, she's, she's always like getting directed by other people. Like she starts the fruit diet because <laughs> of her friend. Um, she's always kind of on the margins, like, right? you know, when the early scene in the gym, she's on the margins of the conversation. She's almost like, I mean, that's where they say she doesn't sweat. You know, in the very first, I think her very first line is it's really cold in here. So, and then in the end, she's kind of living in this refrigerator, basically. You know, which is, which is you know, when they go to that one presentation, it's basically what they recommend, right? That you just live in a refrigerator. And so it's like she's kind of being kept in some kind of cold storage, but it's not clear for what. Um, you know, I mean, she's she's like a fuckable piece of meat, basically, in the first, you know, the first, I don't know, that's how I would read the first scene. It's like she's kind of just this, you know, it's like the class of, classic sort of passive mm -hmm. wo woman. So, I mean, on one level, I think it, it plays into all these feminist themes, um, but not in a very, I don't know, it's like, it's almost just like these are, these are just um, parts of the cultural archive that can be 
summon back up, um, and they're, they're almost like cliched, mm -hmm. I think, by the time the film is made. But um, it, you know, what, what seems more significant is, at least in terms of its its moment of when it was made, is kind of this. Um, you know, accounts of this nascent type of experience, which of course is before the, or it, you know, it's made just as the internet is kind of coming into its own, but it's clearly there's no internet. She can't, she can't go online and go down the rabbit hole that way. If, so she, that's, went, that's if she went online, she would be able to find an identity of activism that right. would appeal to anyone. Um, and it, like, I think the problem is that she just doesn't have a strong sense of self or a real purpose, the, the, as you mentioned, the stepson not being genetically hers is just more evidence that she doesn't have any real connection to almost anyone. Um, but it's not like she's innocent there. She just hasn't found anything to define herself and she's trying with this new uh, chemical activism thing. Uh, she has that take charge moment where she finally feels like she's doing something, which is the, you know, think of the prefab activist identity that everyone has now. Yeah. Um, she's, it's just more honest here that she's like the sad, quiet, empty person. Um, now you can do it from behind a computer and <laughs> post about the evils of chemicals and want censorship and all this. Is it, is it possible that this is what happened? And I, I'm going to try to say something that I think might appeal to most people, um, even feminists. Uh, in the United States and in the West generally, but certainly the United States over the last hundred years, as everyone knows, we saw unprecedented wealth accumulation, right? Just wealthiest people in the history of the world lived here in the last hundred years, right? Incredible number of people, unprecedented number of people lived in wealth. A degree of wealth that allowed for the traditional gender norms to structure the family, meaning that there were housewives, large numbers of housewives, who did not have to work, who could live in comfort for the rest of their lives so long as they remained loyal housewives. That, of course, means that they, are, they end up living a life more or less the way that Julianne Moore lives her life in that movie, which is alone, all day long, with not much to do, very little fulfilling, no occupation, no meaning necessarily to her life. She has to create all the meaning herself, right? In that situation, your mind is going to go places, isn't it? I mean, it's going to go in sort of anarchic places. And I would imagine, it seems like there's been a whole generation or multiple generations, Betty Friedan said, and I hate that book. I mean, that book, if, has anyone read The Feminine Mystique? I mean, it's an amazing tract, but I think she does have in bad ways, but I think she does have a core insight that's really important, that that whole new class of human beings that never really existed before, the wealthy housewives of America, they, their minds degenerated because of this, because of the situation they were in. They were perfectly capable, intelligent human beings who simply had nothing to do, and therefore they looked to things that were frivolous and silly or worse than that. Now, the problem is, in my view, what's happened in the last 20 to 30 years, I suppose, is that those people in particular, and I really mean this, I mean, American housewives, wealthy American housewives, have come to dominate American politics. They are the ones who watch MSNBC. They're the ones who watch CNN during the day. They're the ones who get very excited about the causes promoted by CNN and MSNBC, and maybe the New York Times. I think we've seen this. I think we've seen a rise of that particular kind of woman power, which is not exactly the same kind of woman power that Betty Friedan was calling for, but I do think it has really changed the way we all live, and I think it's the w changed the way we think about politics in this country. Um, and so to me, that's in some ways safe as sort of the base basis of that. Does that, would that be agreeable to you guys as a, as a general hypothesis about what's been happening? Well, uh, it, there's a little bit of sly intersectionality there and it shows how Carol has a maid, Fulvia, that does everything. Right. And running a household and raising children is a difficult, exhausting work. And if someone else is, if that's farmed off to someone else, then like you said, you're you know, left to let your mind wander 
without a strong sense of identity. Um, I don't know. Yeah, I. I uh, so it's a comment. It was the it was the meeting of wealth with traditional gender norms, right? That's that, that yeah. combination created this class of people that well, never existed before. The current situation that we have is is kind of like people pretend that the aims of feminism have not been achieved and they've all been achieved and you see it right now like men make less than women in so many situations you see so many uh straight couples where it's now uh the man is the primary caretaker and the woman works because women make more money they get i mean it's not easy to get a job if you're a man uh it's you have a lot in your favor if you're a woman right now. So this kind of continued analysis of gender as women being less powerful than men is inaccurate because women have all of the power right now, whether good or bad. Um, Majority of college students was, are women. Yeah. I was just gonna, there, there's an interesting line where um, Peter Dunning is like celebrating the things that are before, after, before the men's says, movement, and he says the men's movement, but the, then he also says sensitivity training. Sensitivity in the training in the workplace, the men's <laughs> movement, multiculturalism. Um, yeah, which, which I mean, the sensitivity training thing is is interesting as well in relation to the sort of chemical sensitivity thing, where mm -hmm. you know somehow this kind of attunement to microaggressions is somehow like the which a term that didn't exist at the time, but like you know is, is some kind of equivalent to. You know, and Carol's uh, the, symptoms. The men's movement that he's referencing right. there is the Robert Bly, Iron John, right. late yeah. 80s drum circle stuff, uh, which is really yeah. weird when you, it's very like new age. It was like men need to go off and like be wolves in nature. And it wasn't like misogynist. It was very like soft in this just kind of like mythopoetic a lot of the current kind of like right wing men's stuff is a like edgier sort of version of that. But I mean, if he includes it, then, you know, you can't even say now that men need anything different or need their own space or, you know, <laughs> like you can't say men's movement now. Mm -hmm. I, I want to turn to a, a somewhat different topic and then I want to open it up to questions. So please think about what you'd like to ask us or say. Um, so, I know that you use this term all the time, and I did a search, actually, of the Compact website, and I found the term throughout the site in multiple articles, in fact, I think in your own articles, too. The term neoliberalism. Now, you have every right, when you hear that word, to roll your eyes, because it's used all the time. It's, it's almost become like racism, in that it means just about anything you want it to. But I think for you two, it does mean something particular, and I'd like for you, maybe not, but I'd like for you to explain what it means and why you use that term. Because I think this movie, in a sense, right, it does, it explores some of the themes that you think are attached to neoliberalism. So what does that mean? Why do you use it? Yeah, I mean, well, one point I was thinking about while watching it is, I mean, it's set in 1987, released in 94, 95. Um, so it's, you know, it, it's at that end of history moment, right, where you have the uh, consolidation of American, you know, global sort of military, political, and economic hegemony um, with the collapse of the Soviet Union. And so, you know, I think usually when people talk about neoliberalism, there's sort of a chronology that, you know, in terms of the politics of it, which would start sometime in the late 70s, where you have usually what's understood as a kind of retrenchment against the, the previous you know, post-war paradigm where societies were, you know, on one hand, so, you know, somewhat more sort of patriarchal and, you know, I mean, this, this model of like the male breadwinner was more the standard one than it became afterwards. But then we're also kind of, um, you know, characterized by greater levels of socioeconomic equality, at least as measured by, you know, income, sort of, the, you know, um, the average income of like, you know, people without college degrees, let's say. The poor um, got wealthier. Right, right. so so yeah, the, 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 there was a greater level of equality of, of access to the same social benefits. And then, you know, that sometime in the late 70s through various, and you know, most notably 
the rise of Reagan and Thatcher, who, you know, this film being set in like the last year of Reagan's presidency, um, you know, is sort of consolidated. And then, you know, by the time we get into the 90s, it's, it's taken, I mean, it's sort of become politically the standard wisdom that, you know, you, um, you know, it's, it's good for societies to be more individualistic. It's good to pursue, you know, wealth and affluence. Um, and it's good to, uh, you know, have a, um, it, it, I mean, so, you know, Clinton basically kind of co-opts, you know, the, the more um, successful aspects of the Reagan Thatcherism as does Blair in the UK. And so it's kind of this, um, this time when you have a consensus around what, um, you know, how society and the economy should be arranged. Um, and so, I mean, that's like the political side of it and economic side of it. That's probably what comes up in so the compact more, articles. But, right. But then, you know, I think just trying to go back to kind of the mood of the film and yeah. the, is, you know, on this idea that, um, you know, it's, it's the end of history as um, Francis Fukuyama declared in 1989, but then the second part of that is the last man, who's this figure who comes from Nietzsche, who's kind of this figure of, again, of, I mean, and this is not just of, you know, suburban housewives, but of everybody. It's like when we've reached this end point, what exactly do we do? What, you know, um, what is there left to be done? Um, so there's a kind of, you know, even though there's a, on one hand, there's a triumphalism of this moment, right? We've discovered the model that, you know, allows people to achieve prosperity, um, that gives people greater freedom, um, that ultimately is gonna promise to give, give I mean, it's, you know, this is a period, you know, when women are entering the workforce in much greater numbers. So it's, it can be framed as kind of liberating in all sorts of ways, both, you know, on the conservative end as kind of unleashing the forces of the market to help people become wealthier, but then also, you know, empowering women to enter the economy. And so, you know, but, so there is the, these various ways that it's a triumphal moment, at least in this 90s period, but then there's also this kind of lingering question of, okay, what is there left to do that actually has any, any real meaning or purpose, right? Um, are we just here to kind of consume and die, basically? Right? Which I think is in some ways part of the, the sort of, you know, brooding and like menacing ambience of the film is just sort of that question. And then, you know, I think another film that, expresses this very clearly from a sort of male perspective as Fight Club, right? Where you have this kind of yeah. critique of consumerism, this yeah. notion of we're living in this culture where yes, we have all these, all these goods and comfortable existences and so on, but everything is, you know, it's this nihilism. Everything is fundamentally meaningless, purposeless, purposeless, and it's better to, you know, go out and just engage in pointless violence because at least that fills you with some sense of meaning and purpose, mm -hmm. right? Um, and so, the, you know, I'd, I'd sort of situate the film within that moment, right, where, and then the third, you know, a, a final dimension of it would just be this, you know, that, that it's, it's a period characterized by this idea of, you know, that it's, the, you know, this term bowling alone, right, this general notion of kind of social fracturing, fragmentation. I mean, there's no, you know, with the, the Renwood sequence, we have a certain sense of like, Okay, there's, there's a clear and in a way deliberate sense of uh, that they're trying to conjure up a sense of community, right, of, of a kind of almost a commune-like um, being. But of course, the rest of the world as it's portrayed is very atomized, very, you know, individualized. Um, the, the, in, the context in which people interact seem very artificial, right? It's like the gym or the, um, you know, this kind of, uh, California health food cafe, like there, there's kind of a sense of, you know, there's no sort of organic community that you can, that you can sort of be part of anymore. And so that puts you in this position where you have to, you know, in various ways, like seek out meaning, seek out ways of, again, rendering the world legible, world legible. And that, that ends up being a very, you know, it, it ends up being a very individual and, and often isolating journey, right? Um, but, you know, that, so this is all kind of how I would, characterize the film in relation to that term, but. Yeah. yeah, for hundreds and hundreds of years, humanity struggled night and day with, the, with their fingernails in, this, in the dirt, trying to make money, trying to, trying to achieve wealth, create wealth, and then we finally did achieve wealth in the 1950s, and now that's the problem, is that now we're rich. In the 1950s and 60s, there was this whole raft of sociological literature that came out, I'm sure Jeff knows about it, with titles like The Perils of Affluence, 
I mean, this is what people were talking about at that period. Affluenza. Right? Yeah, affluenza. What are we going to do now that we're all rich, as Jeff beautifully laid out just there? This became the new problem. Like, why is it a problem? Because we have too much time on our hands? I guess it is. It's kind of sad. But what do you think, Jack, about this, about money? Well, in this well it's interesting to watch safe 25, 30 years later because the 80s used to be a kind of sneering academic critic shorthand for empty conformity. And no one associates the 80s with that now. Like everything is so obsessed with the 80s nostalgia. It represents this time of total freedom and like color. And I'm not just talking about anyone with any kind of like based agenda, reactionary agenda, everything, like Stranger Things, all those Netflix shows that everything is just sort of meant to replicate this little bit of remember the 80s. It's like the South Park member berries and member when things were good. Um, but uh, yeah, at that, at the, in the 90s still, you would see movie critics and everything to, you know, the, you see the 80s, it's bad because it represents the Reaganite conformity or whatnot. And you look back now and I'm like, what were they complaining about? All those people, Roger Ebert and everything, every movie, the 70s was good because it was right. new Hollywood, everything had a pessimistic ending, there were no morals, yeah. everything was boring. And then, you know, the movies that ended that, which were still like, pretty arty, like Jaws and like Star Wars and stuff, so, you know, they're sneering because, oh, happy endings, oh, you know, something exciting and, you know, more fantastic for people to enjoy. Um, there was just this massive entitlement about that, but in neoliberalism to me, I don't know where, what the term literally means, but to me it became a term to describe the kind of nebulous aesthetic reducing of everything to cheap utilitarian minimalism and sameness uh, with an ideology behind it because exceptionalism, uh, anything too fancy or loud stands out and is you know, really distracting and disturbing. Um, also, like open plan aesthetics, which took root in the 2000s, uh, where you have the HGTV shows, which I love, uh, where they come in and knock down all the walls. Um, mm -hmm. You know, this seems like a cool open thing. And it is, it's cool. You know, the fusty old houses with their separate kitchens and everything, that it does seem dark and oppressive compared to this big open thing. But open plan is also just a one more tool of, surveillance of no one is to have any pr privacy. Um, and during COVID, that surveillance was so uh, consolidated in the smartphone where, you know, if you do anything wrong, break any of these rules, we're cutting off your bank account, we're cutting off all of this because your entire identity is, assimula is assimilated into this little box where you can be watched, uh, you know, not just money and politics stuff, but sexuality. They want you to be feeding constant sexuality into it as blackmail. So <laughs> we have, because if you misbehave, you will get me too, uh, because you were on your phone, your video drone phone. Um, and yeah, just to me, it means willful austerity. Yeah. I, I mean, yeah, and right. I, I just following up on that, and you know, I say this as a someone who has, you know, two Apple devices in the room with me, but, you know, to me, I'd say Apple is kind of the, you know, the Apple aesthetics are really one of the, re one of the, the right. de defining kind of aesthetic objects that, that comes out of this period. And, you know, part of what's interesting there and I think ties into the film is, you know, Apple is, is good at selling itself as this kind of countercultural thing. It's good at linking itself to, you know, the kind of Californian counterculture um, and presenting itself, and you know, now they're trying to get everybody to buy these new goggles, which are like the latest kind of dystopian phase of all of this. But you know, it's it is interesting in terms of that. You know, the the, the sort of rise of Apple style minimalism is a really key dimension of the, and and you know, just defining both aesthetically and kind of socially what what this world starts to look like, and and kind of design itself in in imitation of 
but it's interesting that it's it's kind of initially sold as an escape from this you know this kind of countercultural escape from this this dominant aesthetic yeah with like the Beatles and everything like <laughs> Apple I mean I still think Apple is cool um, but yeah it had that countercultural thing but the dividing point in the before times and now is the iPhone yeah. like and it literally sure. looks like the 2001 monolith <laughs> dropping down uh -huh. yeah, but for people like me who were alive and like kind of adults before the smartphone when there was internet but not yet smartphones that's the dividing line where nothing is ever the same you know mm -hmm. something i thought i mm -hmm. i found i think i was going to write something about this but i didn't but um the uh, so the iPod, which was sort of the precursor, you know, was kind mm -hmm. of this, um, it, w it was the, the thing that made the iPhone later possible and kind of prepared the, the ground for it, was I think launched like a month after September 11th. So it was, mar it was like launched in October 2001, I believe. So there's something kind of interesting about that chronology because I think it, I mean, and just to go slightly off topic, but it, it ties back to something you were just saying about Stranger Things. This film, um, or sorry, the series, uh, The Last of Us. One thing that I think is interesting about it is, it's you know, the world ends in 2003, I think. And so what that means is, you know, I mean, and going back to your point about the 80s, like one of the more kind of um, you know idyllic scenes is like they're going through the ruins of a shopping mall, right? And this is like. It's this culture frozen in place that's like the mall, it's the mall culture, right? And it's, um, it's one of the few scenes of this kind of genuine, you know, just pure enjoyment on the part of the characters, right? Where they, they've kind of escaped the world and they're just, they found this one shopping mall where like it wasn't entirely ransacked before everybody became. And malls are now a universal symbol of nostalgia and happiness for everyone. Malls up until 2010, used to be a go-to symbol of corporate conformity and you know everybody who was like punk or whatever would hate on the mall it's where dumb people go and now everyone who is like arty highfalutin highfalutin you know uh kind of academic minded uh fetishizes those spaces uh it's really funny and every single show now will have some kind of mall nostalgia all those streaming shows uh everyone wants that it's and it's i mean and part of what you know again the 2003 cutoff is interesting because you know if there's sort of like a long 1990s or something where it's it's before i mean one way to define it is it's before the iphone and so you know if that's kind of the pivotal moment as i said like the ipod is out but you know the the so part of what's interesting about the the last of us is that it it freezes in time the, the kind of material culture of this world just before the iphone mm -hmm. and it really you know makes us just kind of i mean it, it it has a kind of ruin porn aspect to its aesthetic but it also just makes us really appreciate and enjoy the the aesthetics kind of frozen in time of that of that exact moment the way, the way that you both talk about neoliberalism makes me think that it might be a continuation of America's oldest cultural tradition. It sounds like neoliberalism might actually be neo-puritanism. The way you talk mm -hmm. about, I forget the words you use, but austerity, I forget the qualifier for that, but you, right, I mean, somewhat similar to how you were talking about it, Sue. I mean, it, well, it's, but there's yeah, some interesting it's, parts of it, though, because it's also about things like the iPhone, which is clearly not on its face puritanical. It's, you know, it's this new device full of pleasures. But the way that we are told to use it is different, right? Um, is that am I right that this is sort of like Cotton Mather is speaking to us again through this? Right, because liberalism itself is an ideology as it exists now. Democrat liberalism is an ideology of like self-policing and of original sin and guilt, where this applies to every possible functional convenience of life you're supposed to do without something that worked fine before for an abstract ideal of doing you par your part in saving the environment of correcting for things you can't racism. see for yeah. phantom phantom threats yeah yeah and um so there will be those causes the one that i always uh, bring up is plastic bag bands because that was the first time i really saw something that just is stupid and doesn't work suddenly implemented 
and taken away. You know, in Austin in like 2011, they did the bag band thing and you're like, okay, this is really inconvenient. You kind of got used to it, but then they brought it back, brought the bags back, but not everywhere has them. So it's just like Democrats will make up a cause to fundraise uh, for, you know, baby turtles and the plastic rings or whatever. And then they'll abandon it and they'll leave this rubble where everything is just dysfunctional for no reason because of an old puritanical cause. Whereas you just had an assembly line that was hyper-functional before. A new puritanism? Yeah, I mean, well, the, the film, obviously her name is White, so that sort of, you know, the, and, the, and the symbolism is, you know, pretty, um, pretty pervasive um, in terms of, you know, yeah, this kind of... Uh, notion of, of purity is kind of a, uh, a guiding sort of conceptual framework for the whole film. But yeah, I mean, I think there's, there's an element definitely of that and uh, the, these kind of drives to purification. I mean, it's interesting, like the fruit diet is another example, right? Where, um, you know, so it's like the film kind of takes you through certain, you know, it's like she herself goes through a, a sequence of sort of fads that have to do with and the way everyone reacts to the fruit diet, which sounds like this small thing, is like when you start telling your friends you're watching bad videos on the internet. You know, they're like, oh, you know, the <laughs> it's it's just she's getting red pilled. Yeah. Right. <laughs> but anyway, she um yeah, so it, it's interesting how she, you know, is this figure of I mean, and again, part of what's odd about her is her like emptiness that she seems to have no she seems to have no I mean, there's like reference to it would seem her husband having like a a nephew or something, and I mean, there, there, it seems that like he has family. It's not clear that she does. Um, it's, it's so it's like she just seems to be completely disconnected from everything. Um, and so in in that way, you know, and and in a sense, the film is about her kind of disconnection, further disconnection of herself, but then also kind of trying to. And and I, I like your sort of more optimistic reading of. The, yeah, <laughs> I'm know, I'm more optimistic making, now. You know, the guy she makes lasagna with. Is yeah, because like, I used to see, I used yeah. to just watch the Renwood party scene and laugh and go, ha ha, look at these losers in sweatpants <laughs> doing their little dance. But now I watch it and I'm like, that's what it feels like post-COVID to like have any kind of gathering. Yeah, yeah, like yeah. at least they're getting together and like yeah. dancing a little yeah. and like laughing. Like yeah. that's more, that party is more cheerful than like what Zoomers do with the headphones on <laughs> to stop their <laughs> autism and... <laughs> So yeah, I mean, it's it, it's definitely, uh, and going back to the horseshoe point, I mean, it's also true yeah. that, that like with all these things, it just seems like there are sort of, I mean, you bring up autism, right? Like the, this, <laughs> I mean, this whole theme is itself really interesting, right? Because you have like the, the sort of, I mean, again, basically among like affluent liberal women, this kind, you know, is, is who the first kind of constituency of the whole like vaccine autism um, movement is, of course, now we have a presidential candidate who's, you know, closely tied to that, which, I mean, I want to know RFK, I mean, he, very interesting guy to listen to, actually, but, like, I kind of want to hear RFK Jr.'s take on this film, but, um, but, but in all seriousness, um, yeah, I think this, this kind of pervasive concern with purity and purification um, is, you know, I, I think one of the kind of driving forces of it are these kind of yeah, these repeated kind of, um, you know, kind of great awakenings or kind of moral yeah. um, manias that overtake this class. And I mean, the plastic bag ban is, it's, is, I mean, in New York City is ridiculous in part because like now they give out these incredibly thick, but also totally synthetic bags. Yeah, there has to be which some are, like, illusion. Obviously, which are like obviously <laughs> way worse in the exact way that they were supposed to be concerned about. But, you know, it's, it, it's a... Uh, so yeah, it, it's it's this this kind of sequential, you know, series of of sort of moral manias and great awakenings. But but I think it then does. I mean, you bring up autism. Like there was kind of this fascinating long piece by I don't know if, if people follow Tao Lin, you know his you know who's kind of this like New York, you know um, what's it called sort of indie, you know indie lit star basically. Okay. Um, or alt-lit star, but who, you know, g gained some mainstream success, but like his whole thing now is like, you know, his, I mean, his most recent book was called Leave Society, and it's basically, it, you know, it's, it's almost like it would be interesting to read in conjunction with this film, because it's, mm. it's, it's just a semi-fictionalized account of his own mm. 
kind of attempt to extricate himself from all of the toxic and polluting influences. Um, he claims to have also cured, he has wrote a long piece in which he claimed to have cured his own autism through various kind of dietary and environmental adjustments. You know, and that, I mean, that kind of stuff is certainly something you find in kind of right-wing subcultures. It, it's online. something that the movie yeah. shows is how people develop a grift around the central yeah. dissatisfaction because yeah. the Peter Dunning uh, character is someone who has developed a grift uh, for these specific people who got into the environmental illness thing. And, you know, that's not like, not like grifts are inherently bad, like everything is a grift, but that sort of uh, conservative trope of telling you to like leave the city and go off the grid and all of that, I mean, that's total safe stuff because you'd, you're not happy once you get there and you realize like the idealized, uh, you know, away from the city, the country is just like a Chili's or, you know, like you're not happier <laughs> because you're just in so, some buttfuck nowhere strip mall. Right. Yeah. Exactly. It's fake. It just, it, <laughs> like, <laughs> you don't find enlightenment out there. I am you go really, crazy from reading books all the time. I'm really struck by how everything we're talking about here is so American. I mean, this is, these are all American phenomena. I mean, all of it. Um, I would love to open it up to all of you. I'd love to hear what you have to think. Uh, if you have any questions um, or comments, objections, do you just like to scream at us? Uh, anything you want to do? Craig. Go to that right now. I'm going to start with this. Okay. When, when during the Renwood, the Renwood or Renfield? Renwood. Renwood orientation. They showed the video and they discussed that you're going to have separate silent meals, men here, women there. Um, no sexual interaction. Yeah. I thought of you and Puritanism immediately. Right. right, yeah. But you made a good point about them dancing. I was like, I can't, why are they dancing? It can't be allowed. Why are they dancing? So that, that's, the, that's the one thing I thought of as far as Puritanism is concerned because it seemed like they were saying to you, that world is killing you because of the excess. Mm -hmm. Come here, you'll get better because you're restricted to away all the excess. Mm -hmm. It's kind of what I came to as you were discussing. Right. Uh, you don't have a mic, so I'll just say, I mean, your question is basically about something I noticed too, and I meant to bring up, I'm glad you did, thank you, which was the asexuality of Carol and other, the characters generally, right? Um, what do you all make of that? I mean, that was sort of what you're getting at, right? Yeah. That's like a standard uh, Alcoholics Anonymous or like therapy thing where you're not supposed to be right. date or be sexually involved because you're supposed to be focusing on yourself um, so I think, I think it's like a, a realistic aspect of this, this, uh, this, the rules that they would have, this psychology they've developed. It's, you know, and they, the, the self-help 12 step Alcoholics Anonymous stuff is like in the movie a lot. They have that locker room conversation about own your own life. And she says, I eventually found the whole 12 step thing to be just another form of addiction. That's what this new book is saying. We have to own our own lives. It, yeah, it's, it's kind of AA stuff. Another totally American phenomenon, by the way. And I'm, I'm someone who was in AA and I love AA and it helped me, but it is a totally American phenomenon. Yep. Yeah, I mean, I think the, it, 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 my read on Renwood, and I don't know if, Others would agree with this. Is it seems as if it's representing it as like there are kind of two paths within it, and one of them seems to be ultimately more healthy, right? It, it you know, it's the people who are dancing, and you know that that final scene where I guess there's like a you know people aren't required to be there; they're sort of choosing to participate in that. It would seem um, so. It's kind of the people who seem to have found some you know more authentic sense of community than than we see pretty much anywhere else in the film. Um, but then you have the people like you know who's the, God, what's the name of the guy who's like <laughs> sort of Ministry of Silly Walks like off in the field? Lester. Uh, yeah, <laughs> and then like the, <laughs> you know, and Nell and her husband who's like living in the igloo. Um, you know, it, it seems like that, and, and we see um, Carol kind of potentially going in this direction where it's like she's there, but actually she's kind of getting worse like because, the you know, it's like the more she's... Um, you know, separated from all these things, like even, you know, the sort of more intense, the, pre the oppressiveness of the fumes becomes like from the highway far away. So it's like, you know, that's where we see her kind of going in the direction of Nell. 
Um, but then it, it does seem like maybe there, there's sort of another path within this place where they're able to, you know, find some kind of sense of, of community with the other people there. And, um, you know, we see Nell as like this, you know, <laughs> the thing about like she wants to blow, take a gun and blow the heads off of everybody who did this or whatever. Like, so, so there, it seems like there are sort of two paths within that world in my, in my reading. I don't know if you're... All the way in the back. I would say when it comes to neoliberalism, the best way to describe it is it's, it's packaging fake, it's taking symbols that mean something, repackaging it into the fakest, shittiest version of it. And then there's this other aspect to it where it's, it's like a fake nice person where I have an uncle who is very much like, you know, oh, he's got the mask on, and he's got, you know, it's almost like they'll wear the mask or, or do these certain key things to basically say to each other, like, oh, we're the good people, and you're the scumbag. There's, it could be anything. Like, you'll have some asshole walking in the middle of a park with a mask on. It's like, listen, I'm very libertarian. You can do what you want. No problem. But it's, it, it's gone to a point where it's so unobjective where you can tell these people are so hijacked by ideology where simply doing the common sense thing, you know, it's like how many boosters are these people going to get and then turn around and say, oh, well, it's good that you're pro-choice on abortion, but you can't be pro-choice on an experimental vaccine. And it's just unbelievably bad shit. But to, to finish what you were saying, Jack, I 100% agree with the big term was when smartphones ended up being there because from my point of view, it seemed once smartphones ended up becoming adopted by the masses, it became the, that, that's when the whole, you know, let's take a picture photo opportunity for Instagram and that's it. It's fake niceness. It's the same people who will say, let's give money to Ukraine, let's pass the homeless guy who's dying on the side of the street. Yeah, and it's a way to gaslight you, to use one of their favorite words. Uh, it, that whole, like, be a fucking good person. <laughs> be a, just be a fucking good person. Like, they say fuck. Like, it's, it's you know, it's just, like it's common sense to do whatever insane thing everyone's doing and not speak <laughs> out. Because they, they'll turn it around and say you're the one whining. If you have any problem with their fascistic authoritarian measures or you stand up for freedom in any way, they turn it around and depict you as the one whining. It's you, because you can't just stop fucking whining. Yeah. All right, one more. Is it Garrett? Is that right? Uh, Garrett. Garrett. Garrett, yeah. I think I got it right. Uh, you were looking for the uh, RFK Jr. perspective, and uh, I worked partly for the, his publisher, Skyhorse, and mm -hmm. sometimes with his Organization Children's Health Defense, so maybe I should give that. Um, <laughs> I thought the the film was not uh, was maybe dated in some way. Actually, that the affluent liberal person is uh, afraid of industrial chemicals and embracing nature, whereas of course the sort of long COVID people are the opposite. Yeah. And the official liberal narrative is that it's natural; it's not man-made. Uh, We'll hear different perspectives, I think, tomorrow about that. Mm -hmm. and, and I but, um, so, I don't know. That, that seems to me uh, maybe more in line with neoliberalism because, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's the medical establishment, and I guess she's more a fringe figure, but the medical establishment, the, the I think the neoliberalism that I had was more political and economic is that there's a fusion between corporate and state, public and private partnerships. Yep. And so the public health agencies protect the corporate products yep. and they don't tell us about how dangerous they are. And they tell us instead to constantly be afraid of nature, be afraid of germs. Yeah, I, I think that's all um, really well said. And I mean, something that strikes me in the film is like, she's literally out in the mountains and, you know, in this kind of... I mean, I've been to that part of the world. The air is very clear. Um, but, you know, she's wearing, the, she's like permanently wearing this, this like plastic attachment on her face, carrying around this oxygen tank. So it's like, 
I mean, it is kind of that, right, where, um, you know, it seems to be this back to nature, but actually it's this kind of medical, you know, this trajectory towards medicalization where she's kind of this permanent patient um, and, and where the air of, like, the, you know, desert mountains is, is not pure enough for her, right? <laughs> and so th there needs to be this artificial injection of this purer thing um, into her, you know, with the aid of a kind of medical prosthesis. And so, I mean, yeah, I think the film, I mean, right, so it's, you're right that in, I, and I agree with you that in many ways the kind of basic tropes of it of like returning to the land and blah, blah, blah have sort of ceased to be like liberal or lefty ones and have become sort of right-wing coded in various ways. Um, but, you know, and, and like going back to, you know, COVID, you know, that, that like there was kind of this claim that like natural immunity is, is a, you know, misinformation or right-wing conspiracy theory. It's like completely insane um, stuff. But, you know, so, so but you're right that, um, and, and I think it is interesting this way that, you know, is the danger coded as, as somehow, artif you know, artifice or is the danger coded as nature? I think it is important, as you said, that, that in COVID, um, the danger had to be construed as coming from nature because um, it, I mean, for various reasons, without going into it too much, I mean, for one, one reason, I mean, you bring up Skyhorse. Um, Compact just published a piece on a Skyhorse book by Andrew Huff about, you know, the, the, called The Truth About Wuhan by somebody who worked for the, the organization that was basically, you know, he's essentially a whistleblower, like, coming from the organization that, um, you know, funneled U.S. government money to the Wuhan Institute of Virology. And so, like... There's this whole complex, biomedical complex, which is tied to the, I mean, it's state, it's, state, it's corporate, um, it's private, it's NGOs, it's a whole global blob, right? Um, it's tied at very high levels to the US government. And so, you know, part of the reason that COVID had to be natural is just that we had to trust the experts and if we actually looked into the stuff, it would make the experts not look very good at all <laughs> because it turns out they were, they were doing this stuff. I mean, I think, you know, that there's kind of an ease with which these things can kind of flip back and forth depending on the issue and the politics of the issue. Like they're, they're sort of, but, but in, because, you know, in the case of like, say the wildfires in Quebec, right, those have to be somehow the fault of like climate denial. Like they're not, they're not natural, right? They have to be, even though they, they kind of are. And like the fact that forests pretty much anywhere are, you know, the results, the current state of forests anywhere in North America or anywhere is like, the result of hundreds of years of, you know, how they've been, um, you know, how they've been harvested for um, the lump timber industry, how they've been turned into parks, how fires have been deliberately suppressed. So there is this whole kind of history that that needs to be looked into. Um, but it's not in this case the forest fires need to be seen as a threat from nature as the virus did. It's that they need to be seen as proof, and it goes back to Puritanism, like of, as proof of the sin of our culture that we're, we're harming nature through climate and that that's coming, coming back to haunt us. And that, you know, what that really means is that there are these bad people who are climate denialists or whatever who, who need to be uh, reined in and, and uh, prevented from, you know, causing more horrible things like this. So I think that, that sort of fungibility of like, is it nature, is it humanity, is it artifice? Like it, it seems like it can kind of flip back and forth depending on what the, the issue is. Uh, brilliant, thank you. Uh, we, if you have any questions or things more you want to say to us, we will be back in 25 <coughs> minutes. So just hold on. Uh, we're gonna reconvene at three o'clock and we're gonna add Jeremy Kaufman to this panel. So please come back um, and thank you for this. This has been just an amazing start to the festival. <laughs>